So, you know, I have somebody I talked to who's a um, who's a tenured professor at a major uh, university, uh, you know, Ivy League, not uh, Ivy League. No, it's it's on the West Coast. It's it's not that's not Ivy League, but you know, very elite school. And you know, I talked, <laughs> yeah, something. Well, like that. No. <laughs> okay, yeah, what a, a very a very well known, well regarded school on the West Coast. And um, you know, he you know he I I was having sort of a debate with him because he wants to you know organize faculty, try to sort of fight the university from within. And you know, my atti- my attitude is more. I think you just have to sort of give up on it. Now, I wouldn't give up on the law schools. The law schools are very important because federal judges, I mean, and, and regulators come from the law schools. Um, but you know political, you know, economics, I probably wouldn't give that up either. But, you know, most of the rest of the academy, you know, I just think it's, it's too far gone. And if you want sort of to do good research and you want to, you know, get your ideas out there, you know, there's, there's ways to do that. There's ways, there's think tanks, there's, you know, uh, you know, private funders, I, you know, I've made the independent path work. Um, just, you know, what, what thoughts do you have about how much the academy is worth fighting for and worth saving and how much people should just, you know, give up on it? Well, I can certainly understand the impulse of giving up on the academy because it is terribly far gone. I I was just talking to a a very prominent attorney the other day, and he was talking about the legal profession. He says it is so bad now, the kind of woke takeover. He says it's even worse than you think. I said it couldn't possibly be worse than I think because (laughs) as bad as it is, I know how bad it is. Okay, but I feel that way about the academy. But there are sort of two problems with giving up on the academy, um, and it may be that it's you know we we have to give up on it uh, and and have to circumvent it. But that's a whole other discussion. Um, one is that you know when you say well we can't give up on the law schools and we can't give up on economics, you're leaving out and we can't give up on science. I mean the whole scientific establishment is going woke so rapidly, it will make your head spin, especially the medical research academy is just, what's happened there is is stunning and frightening, okay? I have family members who are uh, professors in medical schools and uh, the takeover has been absolute. The prioritization of diversity, equity, and inclusion over things like, you know, curing disease, doing basic scientific investigation as shown in funding, in, you know, grant getting and grantsmanship in who they're hiring and who they're promoting and who they're admitting to medical schools. I mean, so many medical schools now have these blatantly illegal special tracks for minority students. Penn, my own medical school, just announced that, you know, for Historically black uh, college students, they're they're gonna uh, you the MCAT. They don't have to take it. They don't have to submit it. I, I, I'm not kidding. This is really happening. All right. I, I mean, if anybody would challenge this in court, you know, I think the result should be obvious. Um, so it's very hard to cabin, you know, and hive off that part of the academy that's supposedly innocuous and leave the rest of it intact. That's not happening. The second reason that what's happening in the university should be of great concern and, you know, have the alarm bells ringing. And here I am very disappointed with Republicans, Republican legislators to not see this as a national emergency because it is, is that, you know, these elite schools see the economy. What happens in the university does not stay there, right? They are now uh, in control of entertainment, of publishing, of corporations, of nonprofits, of journalism, of the media. I mean, of every sector in the economy that you can think of is being seeded by these young people that have been indoctrinated in woke precepts. And many of them have never heard an alternative point of view. What about what about what about containment? I mean, you have fewer people go to college, starve them of resources. I saw an optimistic article on NBC. It was you know NBC News. It was portraying it as a very bad development. But fewer and fewer young people, particularly in red states, are going to college. Not just controlling for population, but look at number of eighteen to twenty year olds who are enrolling in college. It's down from where it was um, five ten years ago. Apparently, um, why not? 
why not sort of try to accelerate those trends? I think there was a, I think Tennessee did something like they would not give you student aid. Um, they would if you wanted to study STEM, but not if you wanted to study, I think, social science or right. some, something like that. But yeah. What about just trying to just make the universities less important? Well, I mean, that is already happening and it's got a gender inflection to it in that, you know, most schools now, except for the very, very elite who have the pick of the letter, um, they are predominantly female. Of course, I've, I'm about to write a piece that shows that this is a disaster, not only for the university, but for family formation, because women really like to marry up and so there are fewer, fewer men to marry. So that's that's not a good thing. Um, but yeah, I think the way to do that, to circumvent these institutions is to, you know, starve them, starve the beast. I mean, to defund them. And But in order to do that, you really need two things to happen. One is the alumni need to stop giving money and there is no sign that they're doing that. And that is just so frustrating because, you know, these universities, PR establishments are just diabolical. They, uh, they are making out like everything's just fine. It's really wonderful. You know, we're, we're producing these terrific people who are versed in diversity and they're creative and they're innovative and they're, they're competent and they're smart and, you know, all of that and people buy into it. Uh, so the alumni are shoveling money and rich people and donors at these elite institutions until that stops. I don't know how much progress we're going to make. Um, the second thing is, this is why, with all their flaws, we need Republican administrations and Republican control of Congress. And we need leadership, all right? People like uh, Youngkin and DeSantis, who are going to take charge of the Department of Education and say, um, we know that you're discriminating on the basis of race like crazy. No more money, all right? Uh, we're cutting it off tomorrow until you prove that you're not doing that. I mean, wouldn't that be a bold move? The second thing I'm, I'm in favor of is Congress passing a law like Title VI, which has no race discrimination if you accept federal money, that says you have to adhere to First Amendment principles if you're going to accept federal money. And I think if that were enforced and taken seriously, once again, by the Department of Education, um, then that would work wonders, you know, that would really help. It wouldn't uh, solve you, the problem, but it would mm, help. Yeah. I mean, I, I worry about the implications for religious schools. So if religious schools have this, uh, you know, it's doctor schools, you know, I mean, there are ways around all of this. Uh, I think there are ways to, to sort of deal with this. Um, you could design laws that would help. I'm not saying they would solve the problem because the problem with universities is that the people in charge are self-perpetuating. They are the gatekeepers for the next generation. So as you pointed out earlier, you know, they are going to be very vigilant in not hiring people who have the wrong opinions. They want to keep conservatives out. Uh, but think about it. That means that the views that, you know, most people hold are now banned from the academy. I mean, we have the academy as this enclave of the opinions held by 8% of the population. Well, you know, because you generate some of this data, right? Um, so there's no magical solution, but I think starving the beast, um, cutting off the funding, uh, finding ways around needing a university degree. Now, I think the real hard nut to crack here is the elite universities who only graduate about four or five percent, you know, the so-called selective or competitive universities of the people who get a four-year degree. So schools that accept, let's say, less than a third of their applicants are a remarkably tiny percentage uh, in, just in terms of the number of people coming out of them, uh, of college graduates. So these schools have enormous cachet uh, enormous outside pow outsized power for uh, entree to the upper middle class and the ruling class. Um, and as long as there is this fetish among, you know, high flying finance firms and corporations and prestigious positions in journalism and the like for Harvard, Yale and Princeton, it's very, very hard to uh, make inroads into the power of these institutions. Um, 
it's interesting because I just read a brief in the Harvard case. This is the Harvard affirmative action case that's going to be heard before the Supreme Court next term. Yeah, I was, was just going to ask you how, how important how important is it? Because what you sound like what you want to do with First Amendment, that seems like what they you could get an interpretation of Title VI that says no more racial discrimination. Um, well, right. So how, yeah. So go ahead. So the question is, how much good would that do? Right. Um, I have a contingent of friends who say no good whatsoever. I mean, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton will find a way around it. They will um, drop the SATs. They will uh, dilute the meritocracy. They will obscure the fact that they have double standards, you know, blatant double standards, academic double standards for different groups. Um, they will get what they want. Okay, so there is that contingent. Um, there are other people who think that this will actually have bite. But, you know, apart from whether the Harvard case will really make a difference, there is this interesting brief that was f filed in the Harvard case by a group of prominent businesses. And here's what it said. It said, oh, we need affirmative action uh, because we need to recruit from schools that have a diverse student body uh, because they make better decisions, make better employees. You know, they're trying to beef up this whole notion that diversity doesn't just have pedagogical value, but it has business value. It has economic value. Well, they're trying to soften the court up for the idea that diversity in hiring is okay too, which, you know, their educational affirmative action cases don't imply at all, but leaving that aside, and therefore, you should retain affirmative action for these elite institutions. Well, what's the answer to that, Richard? The answer is very simple. If you want a more diverse workforce, if we abolish affirmative action, just go to other schools. You know, so you can't recruit at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Big friggin' deal. I mean, why do you have to have those institutions be your HR department? The students are what they are. They're as able as they are. The fact that they're going to University of North Carolina at Greensboro or whatever, as opposed to Yale, how does that make a difference? You know, go to Howard, go to other places, go to the places where blacks would get in on a colorblind basis and recruit them there. Now, of course, they would say, well, we need the white students at Harvard and Yale, and we need to expose them to diversity because. That makes them better employees. Well, you can get white students at these other places too, you know. I mean, the snob value here is just unbelievable. And of course, the implicit myth is that if you take a given student of given ability and you send them to Harvard, that they'll somehow come out smarter and better and more capable than if they go to a school where they're well-matched. Like, there's zero evidence for that. Zero. Yeah. And so- In fact, yeah. evidence of the opposite. Because there's there's data from Duke that suggests that if minority students are overplaced, that is, you know, they go to a school where they wouldn't get in otherwise, that they tend to drop out of hardcore majors more often. They learn less at these schools where they're overplaced through affirmative action than they would if they went to a school they would otherwise get into. So we have all of these kind of myths, these these preening assumptions uh, that make it very hard to undermine the power of these institutions. I mean, your ideas are as good as mine about how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm.